Software Engineering Radio Episode 57 Compile Time Meta Programming with Converge. Welcome listeners, thanks for once again tuning in to Software Engineering Radio. This episode is on compile time meta programming or creating domain specific languages through syntax extension. Um, in order to talk about this rather non mainstream topic, we have a guest. Our guest today is Lawrence Tratt. Um, he's a research fellow at the Department of Computer Science at King's College in London and he's co lead of their software and systems modeling team. He is also the creator and inventor basically of the Converge programming language. This language implements the concepts we're going to talk about in this session. Um, this is once again a session about language design with a specific focus on domain specific languages. It's going to be very interesting. Have fun and uh, again we uh, recorded this episode at the CHO conference 2006 in Denmark in Aarhus and um, yeah, have fun. Welcome our guest, Lawrence Tratt. Uh, welcome, thank you very much. So we're talking today about, uh, that's a fancy title, DSL implementation at compile time via syntax extension. Um, and also, maybe another title could be compile time meta programming. Yes, you could uh, say that. You could also simplify it somewhat if you wanted to just saying macros. Um, as an academic, we like to choose ridiculously long titles. <laughs> yeah, and, and also there are probably differences t with regards to macros as we know them as in C++ or C, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So, I mean, we've, we've talked in previous episodes about DSLs, uh, so we probably don't have to fill people in about what a DSL is, but um, if you could give us your interpretation of what you think DSLs are important for and why you chose to uh, implement DSLs the way you do it, and and maybe also explain in, in <laughs> as an overview what the way actually is you choose to implement DSLs. Okay. Um, well, I think the term domain-specific languages has been around for a very, very long time. And I think that it's kind of been forgotten at various stages. Uh, what's interesting is that we're going through a resurgence in use of the term. And if you go out to the developer on the street and say DSL, one of the things you're going to get back a lot now is talking about the use of Ruby, uh, the way that they're doing these little in sort of inline DSLs, some function calls using some of the little block structures they have to get things going. Uh, I think that's a perfectly valid use of DSL. However, I don't think that it's necessarily uh, using the concept to its fullest potential. So what I would like to see with DSLs is people using some fairly rich languages, new languages, new syntax, uh, to express things that they were very difficult to express before. So it's more than just hacking around a little bit with some programming language stuff that you already have. It's very much about creating something new, uh, allowing you something that you couldn't do easily before. And that's primarily uh, syntactically something different? or uh... I think that if you want people to have a good chance of expressing something very useful that they couldn't do before, it does involve new syntax. Yeah. I mean, the Ruby folks, and we'll talk to Obi Fernandez about this stuff in a subsequent episode, the, the, if you have embedded syntax in, or embedded DSLs in Ruby, the freedom you have for adapting a syntax is limited. And I guess that's one of the focus points where you think you try to do better at that. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think what they're doing is they're making very good use of things they already had. Yes. Um, but, of course, that only gets you so far. And that may be all you need. But if you restrict yourself to that, you're very much constraining the possible universe of things that you can express. Okay, so um, if we try to um, go back to what a DSL actually is, I think you have this nice uh, paraphrase stuff from this guy called Hudak. I, I don't didn't know him personally or, or actually didn't know his name. So does it make sense to briefly go over uh, this characteristics of DSLs and then show where you disagree? Yeah, I think it's a very good thing. So my thinking behind this is although the term DSL or maybe not the, always the term, but the concepts have been around for a long time, uh, there's some very nice a pair of papers from 1996 from a chap called Paul Hudak, and I apologize if I pronounce his surname wrong. I've never met him no. either. <laughs> uh, from the University of Yale. Uh, 
And what he did at that point was uh, nailed down what it is that's interesting about DSLs, some of the relevant issues, and um, some very high-level points. So maybe I can go over those. I think they're quite useful. One of the things he was saying is that uh, outlining what a DSL should be, uh, and he has several points. I think the ones that are most relevant, as he's saying... A DSL is an abstraction relevant to a specific domain. In other words, you take a particular problem and you say, well, here's how I can express it in a normal programming language. You know, I have to do this function call and this function call. That's very low level. How can I move it up a level? Then you have a DSL. He also said DSLs need to lead to a demonstrable increase in productivity in yep. the sense that if it still takes you as long to do what you wanted to do as you could do before, you haven't really gained anything. You have to get something useful in productivity from using a DSL for it to be useful. He's also basically saying that you want to try and make it no more difficult than using a normal programming language. In fact, if you're lucky, you might be able to make things more accessible than a normal programming language. And this is the idea of having non-programmers program, program using a DSL. At least that's kind of the you know the holy grail. Yes, that's the probably unachievable ho- right. holy grail <laughs> in the end. I think you have to be realistic about these things. But the, the more that you can lower the barrier to entry is a good thing. And uh, I think the final aim that, that Hudak outlined is that people who are using DSL, they need to be able to write their solutions in the DSL fairly easily, and they need to be able to maintain that well that's something that's rather critical you don't want to write a dsl on friday afternoon in the office come back in on monday and think what the hell does this do you know i can't understand what i've written yeah so and 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 you're kind of advertising the idea of integrating dsls into a host language which is just for our listeners uh, a different approach compared to uh, what we talked about in our model development episodes and it's comparable to what the ruby folks do um so why do you think it's it's useful and important to embed it in a host language and and what are suitable host languages okay uh it's a very good question uh i think the reason that you want to embed things in a host language is the alternative is making a standalone DSL, and to yes. me, the best example of that is Make. Most people are going to be familiar with Make, I guess, that yeah. listen to this. Yeah, I think uh, so. Make is a great is a great tool. I still use it as I'm old fashioned, uh, but it's also very complicated. It has its own grammar. So someone somewhere, some poor person, has implemented a very complex tool. They've gone away and created a grammar using Lex and Yak. They have you can almost view Make as a sort of a little virtual machine in a sense for Make files. Yep. It's a complex standalone application, and you can't reuse any of it. And it has to have all the support for you know error handling, reading in files, all this thing at a low level. So I think the reason you, one would like to embed DSLs in a programming language is maybe we can get some of this low-level stuff that's not really relevant to the problem we're trying to do. Maybe we can get the host language to do it for us. Mm-hmm. Um, and- for example, ex- expressions could be kind of an an obvious candidate for that yes Uh, and also you hopefully will get simple things like simpler input output you'll be able to maybe use things like the error messages there's a whole host of things that you hopefully pick up for free now exactly what you consider to be a good host language is dependent on opinion so uh, Hudak for example thought that everything should forcibly be in Haskell (laughs) Um, and although I have nothing personally against Haskell I'm not sure this is an entirely realistic thing to expect of people. So uh, I think that the sort of host languages that you need, as a bare minimum, they have to be very flexible host languages. Now, I also furthermore believe that really that means you need to be able to extend their syntax. So uh, the fact that a language like a a Ruby thing is a very flexible language, like a Python, is not quite the same thing as a a sort of a Lisp-like language, perhaps, which suddenly you can start extending it in ways the original designers never thought of. But that's maybe because the Lisp language basically has no syntax, so it's easy to extend it by you know not at you know I mean just it's trees, absolutely lists. Yep. Um, so Lisp is not a good candidate because no one's going to use it. That's the other <laughs> point. Yes. Um, <laughs> and it's so minimalistic that you can do anything you want with it, but it doesn't give you enough at the beginning to start with. Yeah. So that's a non-starter. So what you're really looking for is a sort of a mix, I think, of uh, what I would call a modern programming language, you know, something that looks like a, a Python, a Ruby, a Java, or even a C++, whatever you consider that a normal developer will be comfortable with, with some of this flexibility that goes back to the Lisp sort of days. So what you did then is kind of to invent your own language um, called Converge or Converge. Um, I guess you'll talk about it in a minute. 
and um, specifically this language supports uh, as I understood a macro system that supports DSL so I think it's worth talking about this one okay so converge is a language uh, a new language um, it looks initially a lot like Python to people I think that's what people will fir- first notice about it. it looks like Python's been a bit disguised by somebody um, and then on top of that, it has this compile time metaprogramming stuff. Now, compile time metaprogramming is a very unwieldy term, but basically it means it has a macro system. And the macro system thing that it has uh, is very heavily influenced by that in template Haskell. So for anyone who thinks that I'm maybe bashing Haskell earlier, <laughs> there are some genuinely good ideas that one can pluck from these languages. And so what Converge has is three language features it needs to integrate a compile time metaprogramming facility into it. Um, you have to have a macro call. Now that's a very standard and easy thing, goes all the way back to Lisp. And then the next thing that it has is something that has stopped any language since Lisp having a decent macro system effectively. And that is, you need to be able to build up abstract syntax trees. So let, let, let me just pedal back one step to, to make sure we don't lose our listeners. The idea of, of compile time metaprogramming is basically that you have a way of adding source code to the program that is not evaluated at runtime but rather during the compilation process and the result of evaluating this piece of source code is a syntax tree that is then integrated into what into the byte or machine code that the compiler creates right yes absolutely so the trick is with uh, this compile time metaprogramming is you're interacting with the compiler the compile compiler goes around compiling a file much as a normal compiler does and it hits something it's called a splice in converge but you can just call it a macro call it's, that's fine and when it hits one of those it's ooh, and it effectively evaluates that expression at compile time and that expression has to return an abstract syntax tree which is basically an object object graph yeah, yeah representing some code um, and that's relatively well known how to do the this this macro call this splice thing um and converge does some has some neat little tricks that actually make it rather easier to use than even say something like template haskell but it's fundamentally a, a relatively well solved problem the trick is how you make these abstract syntax trees yep and and just to again to relate this to for example c macros um it's a bit different because a c macro is evaluated on source level so it returns kind of a piece of text that is replaced with a macro call right so uh yeah i mean a c macro system and i happen to enjoy c macros because they're kind of fun in their own weird twisted little way (laughs) um but they're very much a double barreled shotgun and you can't really control and when you pull the trigger the bullet can go anywhere yeah there's no typing no error checking recently and uh... it's basically just text um expansion and really the c macro system you can use it with any language the c preprocessor doesn't really know anything much about c at all um the point of these more advanced macro systems is they're very well integrated into the language they can make certain safety guarantees that for example uh in a c like macro system or any templating type thing like that uh, you've got the chance of um variables from two different things conflicting with each other and Mm -hmm. the preprocessor in c can make no guarantees about that people go through all sorts of hoops adding extra brackets and (laughs) crossing their fingers that nothing goes wrong Whereas uh, in Converge, a lot of this stuff is handled for you. You don't have to worry about, well, you don't have to worry as much about shooting yourself in the foot. Yeah. One of the tricks of of Converge is then, I guess, that you can program the code that creates the AST in the same language as, you know, also in Converge. Right. Yes. So it's a completely homogenous environment. Right. Yeah. So you during the compilation, you probably actually run some kind of virtual machine that interprets the stuff and. The, so the Converge compiler is written in Converge. So the compiler is running in the virtual machine. So when it comes across one of these little splice things, it's just temporarily compiles a, a temporary module and injects that in the virtual machine it's running in anyway. So there's a complete interaction between the compiler and the splice code. And that's rather important because yes. it allows the user code to interact with the compiler, get it to do things on its behalf, ask it questions, and mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Okay, so in addition to the splice construct, I think there are two others. One is the quasi-quote and the other is the insertion. Can you explain them briefly and then we'll go on and show how they fit together? Well, quasi-quote is, and that this name, I'm not quite sure how they came up with it, is from the template Haskell people, is the mechanism that allows you to build abstract syntax trees. And, and the way it does it is incredibly intuitive. They solved a problem that no one had solved since Lisp. And what, what you do is you ex- 
surround a normal expression that you write in the programming language with some funny brackets. It's a square bracket and a vertical bracket at either side. And so you have an expression like 2 plus 3 surrounded by these funny brackets, and that evaluates to some objects which are the abstract syntax tree. So in that case, the uh, outermost object is going to be a plus object. On the left-hand side, we'll say integer, and then it will say 2, and on the right-hand side, it will say integer and 3. And so suddenly you can create these uh, very abstract things, they're called abstract syntax trees unsurprisingly, using the normal concrete syntax that you're familiar with. Instead of writing code that says uh, new AST node uh, blah 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 dot plus uh, add child new AST node integer blah blah. You've hit the nail on the head as to why these systems have always failed horribly before yes. because that is a completely unscalable approach. Absolutely, yeah. That's also, just to, to diverge briefly, this is the reason why in model-driven development, you don't use a model-to-model -model transformation to create source code because that would go back to creating instances of the source nodes, uh, of, the, of the code nodes, kind of, of the AST of the target language, and that's just horrible. Yes, absolutely. And so finally, there's this, the third feature is by far the least complicated. It's called insertion in Converge. It's called something rather different in template Haskell, and basically it allows you to merge ASTs together. So you can build ASTs up in chunks and then nicely in using the normal syntax merge these things together okay so um that allows us basically to to <laughs> to hack the stuff the compiler does by modifying uh the output of the, the, the ast it creates based on code that looks just like the other code in our source code but that's not yet uh, dsl right so so where does how does this relate to what else is there in converge to to make it a dsl friendly language and how does this look like yeah, you're, you're very much right in saying that, that that's not uh, all that you need for DSLs. And in fact, I think what's worth thinking about here is why would other languages have had one of these macro facilities? Well, Lisp has one because it doesn't have anything enough built in. It has to have a macro language to try and build you extra complex things on top. Mm -hmm. C has one because C is a very annoying language to program in. <laughs> you have to have this preprocessor to make it at least somewhat palatable. The compile time meta programming Converge on its own it's a fairly rich language. It has all the things that you expect. So really, it's all put there to enable DSLs. And it turns out that to have DSL support, that is where you can have a little bit of your source code that's a completely arbitrary syntax of your choosing. You need one extra language feature. Uh, and that's called the DSL block. And it looks rather like a splice, uh, a normal splice in the compile time metaprogramming sense. And that single feature allows you uh, which is really only about 10 lines of code in the compiler. It's a very simple layer on top. Suddenly allows you to embed these completely alien-looking things and make the whole facility underneath worthwhile. So you say that there is this piece of um, converge code, and uh, then there is some kind of marker that, that, that defines what kind of DS... Just like maybe in HTML, where you have the script, and then type equals JavaScript or something, and then there is this other code, and, and the trick then is that uh, this code is process during compilation it's pretty much the same thing um obviously there's a, a lot more to this than there is in the the example you outlined but we'll these, talk about it in a minute yeah, but the principle is the same You're okay right. let's just let's let's talk about an example and the example uh, you talked about in the talk this morning and again we're recording this at the joe conference in denmark in october what is it 2006 um <laughs> um the example you you showed there is a timetable something to describe a uh, train time train timetables um there so what do you have to do as a as a dsl developer not as a dsl user as a guy who extends the compiler what do we have to do to make this work okay um well the first thing that uh, you have to be aware is that dsl blocks this dsl input that the user writes is just really a, a random string the compiler doesn't know anything about it yeah so as the DSL implementation author, the person defining the DSL, you have to do several things. The first, obviously, is you have to design a language of some sort because the input must be coming into a format that you have told the user to conform to. So grammar definition or what? Probably. It's, okay. free, it's, a, it's a free country. You can do it however you want. I would very <laughs> much suggest that you do it in a traditional way where you define a grammar and pass it. Yeah. Um, and then you get a pass tree and you write a little translator thing that takes in a parse tree and returns a converge abstract syntax tree. So can you maybe just for our not so language savvy listener subset uh, explain the difference between a parse tree and a language, an AST? I can indeed. So um, parsing is a very fun activity but one that's shrouded in mystery and it's actually 
could be much simpler than it often appears. Basically, it's a two-stage process. The first thing that happens is you take your input and you tokenize it or lex it, depending on how you like to call it, and all that's doing is splitting it up into words. So it's like taking a random European language and saying, well, whenever I see a space, that d delimits mm -hmm. two words in a full stop similarly. Then you take all these words that you've tokenized, and then you try and actually make sense of them in terms of the grammar. So if you make a, a natural language example, you're trying to say, okay, what's the verb in my sentence? What's the, the nouns and so on? And then you're trying to make a tree structure out of that that allows you to d determine how the sentence that's come in is structured. But at this point, all you've done is determine what the user's told you. So that's the parse tree. That's the parse tree. And then you're converting that however you want and into the abstract syntax tree. And there may be a very close relation between the two. But um, the, you, your translation, you're effectively writing a mini compiler. Right, and, 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 and the, the abstract syntax tree is basically an instance of the... It has to be in terms of the host language, right? So you, you, you're, you're converting your domain-specific language syntax, parse tree, into a set of constructs, objects, instances of AST types of the host language of Converge. Yes, uh, if it's easier to think of, you can think of it, I think, without objects. You can imagine it just as a textual templating approach. If you think of a, yeah. a, a sort of a model to text translation, yeah. effectively, the abstract syntax tree is like the template text. But you don't, you don't, you don't do it with templates. You actually, in fact, technically, you do it by instantiating the AST object. Yes, because you get an awful lot of benefits that way. But that's it's a somewhat sometimes a slightly hard concept to get hold of yeah. so if if you move in your mind from templated text to nice objects that do lots of other things for you then you're on the right path okay one thing i'd like to talk about before we move on in in how to implement the dsl um obviously that should have become clear by now we're talking about textual dsls there is no way of integrating some graphical notation because the editor won't make that you could maybe do some ASCII art. and <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Maybe for tables. Um, so what about parsing? Do I have to write my own parcel to build the parse tree? Okay, so parsing is one of these things, I, I think I said earlier, is absolutely yeah. shrouded in mystery. Um, it goes back to the, the fact that it's in the mid-1960s that the, the theoretical computer science people really started looking and thinking, well, you know, we're doing a lot of this programming stuff now, we have different programming languages. How are we going to make sense of this? How are we going to come up with nice ways of understanding what the user's told us? And, of course, computers at the time were incredibly slow. So they invented some very limited algorithms that can't pass a lot of languages. It would be a bit like saying, I have a way of passing natural language. It works very well for Luxembourgish. Subject, and, and subject, <laughs> predicate, predicate, object kind yeah. of complexities. Yeah, and it's not going to work for English or French or German. And you think, yeah. well, that's not entirely useful, is it? Yeah. It's very limited. And we're actually still stuck with this today. So people have a very negative opinion of parsing because we're stuck with weird terms like LR, LL, LALR. None of these terms we should be forced to know. Yeah. Um, they really just tell us about the limitations of the underlying algorithm. The good news that's um, not that well known, so I hope that I'm spreading you know, the good news gospel here, <laughs> is that there are much better algorithms out there that allow you to pass any context-free grammar and any sane programming language, and C++ is excluded from this, is context-free, which means you can pass nearly anything that you can imagine. So if you're a DSL author, what you have to do is say, okay, there's a passing algorithm built in to Converge. It's called an early parser. It can do anything that I want, really. I just yep. have to write a little simple grammar definition. And unlike using Lex or Yak or, or Java CC or those sort of things, I can write it in a way that makes sense to me as a human and I'm not subject to the whims of the parsing algorithm. So you said before that um, the user has to come up with some way of transforming the string into a parse tree and then in an AST. But you, basically what you say is that there is a built-in library that helps you um, do this if you provide an early uh, grammar and then you get all the magic. So the, 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 the function to implement the, the DSL parsing is a couple of lines calling the library, I guess. Absolutely. Uh, it's one of the uh, fundamental philosophies that I've had when creating Converge is that um, DSLs follow a fairly standard set sequence of steps. And one of those is every DSL every sensible DSL, is going to pass some text, get a parse tree, and then translate that. So why not have a single function that takes this in and returns a parse tree? And that's exactly what there is there. You, uh, when you write one of these little DSL implementation functions that 
that takes in a DSL block. It's basically the handler function for a particular kind of syntax. Yes, exactly. Uh, it uh, You say, okay, well, here's I'm going to hand off to another function. Here's the input I got from the user. Here's a grammar. Um, here's some extra keywords that maybe I need to know about. And that's it. Please give me back a pass tree. And it does. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the manual work, the tedious parsing stuff is gone away. And then the grammars you need to write are basically some kind of EBNF-like thing where you define keywords and, and tokens and stuff. Yeah, it's a fairly standard EBNF type thing. Um, of course, as going back to what I said earlier, it's it's a pure EBNF in the sense that it's not like a Yak sort of thing where if anyone has ever had the misfortune to use Yak, you write what looks like a perfect EBNF notation, you run it through Yak and it says shift reduce error. <laughs> what the hell is a shift reduce error? Why do I care about this? Yeah, yeah. None of that sort of stuff. You just put in your normal EBNF notation and it does it. Yeah, but you you, you don't add any... Uh, side effect declarations or you know this this stuff you do this in a separate function that's actually the transformation from the parse tree to the AST um, what, so in a lot of parsing tools uh, as the parsing algorithm is, is parsing yeah. this text you're also doing side actions but right, a lot right. of those are because of the sort of limitations of again of machines 40 years ago where they <laughs> couldn't hold things in memory yeah. nowadays it's much easier to pass the whole text and get build it, the whole thing exactly build a whole tree and in converge those are represented as nice simple lists yeah. and then to go over that fully created tree and do things then and, and that makes a lot of things an awful lot easier it's kind of like sex versus dom in, in xml processing kind of the, it, this is very much a dom view of the world right. not a sax view of the world yeah, yes yeah, yeah. so and then you you write probably uh functions that transform the the parse tree elements into objects in the in the in the AST and I and now obviously you write these functions in in Converge. Yes. And probably the nice thing is that there you probably then use the splicing stuff to actually create the objects for the AST, which is actually quite nice. Yes. So that again, this is very much this idea of a, of an homogenous environment that. Um, a translator is, I use the word translator because I don't necessarily like to use the term mini compiler, it frightens people. But that's really, <laughs> really all that it is. But a lot of the hard work is taken out of it. It's not frightening like compilers yeah. are. Yeah. Um, and uh, Converge gives you a very, very simple framework. And basically you write one function per rule in your grammar. Mm -hmm. And that takes in a little bit of a parse tree and, as you said, creates the objects for an abstract syntax tree. And you're just using those three uh, compile time metaprogramming features we talked about earlier the splice the quasi quote and the insertion that's it everything is built out of those okay so let, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about error reporting um, this is an interesting topic because some of you listeners might have heard about using uh, C++ templates for compile time metaprogramming which first of all it looks awful and second um, one thing that is really cool about it, if you do something wrong, you get those error messages with, you know, where a, a, an error message is like 25,000 characters long because some identifier has been built up through concatenating the, the recursive template evaluations. So that's a big problem. So um, one thing you have uh, talked about in your presentation is that um, error reporting is something you've specifically taken care of in Converge. And I think it's worth talking about. Yeah, well, it was one of those things. I mean, it's obvious in a sense that error reporting is important. No one is in their right <laughs> mind is going to say it's not, not important. important yeah. But, I mean, uh, when I delivered the first version of Converge, it had some nice-ish error reporting things, but it, it just didn't seem enough. And what became clear to me is that both the person who writes the DSL, the implementation author, and the people who use it require good error reporting. And generally neither side got good error reporting. At yeah. best, maybe one or the other did. And yeah. th those systems were few and far between. So it became very clear to me that if you want to write a good DSL, well, even if it's good, it's still going to have problems. And I've never written an error-free line of code yet in my <laughs> life, and I don't expect there are many people out there who have. Yeah. So you've got to come up with a way that you can report errors to both the implementation author and the user. Um, and, and that is particularly tricky because if you consider for example again C macros um, if the compiler reports an error then of course the error is reported based on the code that is there after the macro has been expanded but if the developer looks into the source code of course the macro is there so it's very hard to actually find out what's happening and I guess it's kind of the same problem here because the error is reported based on the abstract syntax tree that has been created from the transformation instead of what the DSL input was like. Well, that's one of the things that I set out to tackle, and I think that I've come up with a, a solution that seems to be very neat and seems to tackle the whole problem 
as it were. So the basic philosophy is this. Um, there's a concept in Convergent, it doesn't really matter what it's called, called a source info. And basically it tracks uh, the location of um, some source code from the point that it's passed until the point that it's converted into a bytecode instruction run in the virtual machine. Someone like the traceability stuff the MDA folks talk about? Yes, it is very similar to that. But it's very different than the way that these things are normally done in programming languages. Normal programming languages, if an error happens at runtime, you get a little report saying, at line such and such, this error occurred. But there's very much the idea that each error is just associated with one line. Yep. Uh, in Converge, the, because when an error happens, it might be related either to the user's DSL input or the translation that the DSL implementation author uh, created, error reports can be associated with uh, more than one source location. So you mm -hmm. can get an error and it says, well, I got to this point in the stack frame and this is associated with two source code points or three or four because you can layer DSLs. Mm -hmm. And then if you're a DSL user... So you said you can layer DSLs, that means you can embed DSLs in other DSLs. You can indeed. Nice. <laughs> so that means, again, you have to take a, a dramatically different approach because if error reporting was just based on uh, reporting some weird part of a C++ compiler's string concatenation, well, you won't even be able to work out which layer of your embedded DSL the thing occurred in, let alone any more details. So yeah. here the error report comes back and says, well, the error is related to the third line in your DSL input as a user and in this line in Converge source code, which was the translation class. So both the user of the DSL and the implementation author can track down the error and work out which one of them was responsible. Another thing that's maybe uh, interesting is that you talked about before that that um, having DSLs integrated into a host language is particularly useful because you can reuse parts of the host language and one specific aspect is probably the expression language. So um, am I right there? You are very right because one of the things that, uh, again going back to this nice chap Mr. Hudak noticed, is that DSLs always tend to evolve their requirements and one of the things that he put his finger right on, on, on the money here is that as they evolve, they always tend to evolve features that people wanted to get in from programming languages. Yeah. In other words, you start with a small DSL, and then you think, I really need a for loop in here. Oh, then I really need the if statement, and then, then something that looks like a function call. They always start to create features of that ilk. So if you're going to add in an expression language, you don't want to do what most DSLs do, which is put in a badly designed one that's been created from scratch, <laughs> been badly implemented, badly yeah. debugged, and tends to fall over in horrible ways. Yeah. So Converge allows you to embed its own expression language within DSLs. That way, you're taking advantage of the fact that somebody, in this case me, has designed, hopefully designed well, but that's uh, another <laughs> issue, uh, designed and implemented and tested and debugged that thing. And in fact, you can add this expression language into your DSL to two lines of code for mm -hmm. a DSL implementation author. So suddenly... Uh, rather than having to write hundreds and hundreds of lines of code to make their own one that's basically a bit crappy, they use someone else's for two lines of code. So you, these two lines of code in your DSL, probably grammar, or is it in the grammar where you say it? Or, or does it say, you know, you can use any kind of converge code here? Or is it only, you know, you can use expressions or you can only use function calls? Or can you restrict what you can use from the host language? You could, in theory, embed any part of Converge you wanted. Yeah. Uh, in practice, I would very much suggest that you stick to just embedding the expression language. Fortunately, the expression language in Converge includes things like function definitions mm -hmm. because it's an entirely expression-based language. So functions evaluate to function objects that you can then call. Mm -hmm. So you could, with that, you can probably do nearly everything you're likely to want to do. Um, and if you're particularly masochistic, maybe you can do some other things as well. <laughs> okay, so maybe to... to, to maybe not yet directly wrap up, but to, to, to summarize what we talked about. Um, one thing you, you kind of uh, emphasize is that you don't just have a language, but rather a kind of little mini process that, that kind of suggests to people, with free country, everybody can do what they want, but suggests to people a process of how to build a DSL and as part of Converge. Yeah, I think this is something that's very important. One of the problems, if you do a standalone DSL, you know, you go out and make something that looks a little bit like the Make program, you have to start from scratch. There's no obvious order in which you need to do things. Uh, and so the problem is you have a slightly random sequence of steps every time you do it. And as we all know, when you do a slightly random sequence of steps, the result might be rather random as well. So Converge has a sort of implicit process as I think of it. And 
the way that it does it is really there are several features built in language that say, well, if you do this step, then you might as well do this step yeah. next. And it really starts off with the fact, as I said earlier, you can use the normal converge tokenizer to tokenize things. Mm-hmm. Now, you can do it, write your own tokenizer if you want, but don't. We, but we're really, why? I mean, yeah. what's the point? Exactly. So if you start with that, and then you write a grammar, those are the steps one and two, then you write a translation class, and then you test and debug it, then you deploy it. And each one follows very naturally from the other, and you don't have to put a great deal of brain power in thinking, how am I going to create this thing? That's pretty much mapped out for you. So, and deploying means uh, you can wrap this as a kind of library and, and make available to your users, or...? Oh, well, deployment means whatever you want it to mean. That's the one thing that uh, nece- it doesn't really give you any great handle with because deployment means, you know, shoving things off to different people's different architectures. Okay, but so is there a way of packaging up such a DSL definition? There, there is because um, one, one of the things I haven't mentioned is Converge is a little unusual. Um, if you think it's just a Python style language, it's a bit unusual in that every single file is compiled to a bytecode file and all those are linked together into a binary file. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously it's not a machine code executable, but it, it could as well be. So you can just ship that single linked executable off to somebody. And if they've got the Converge virtual machine at the other end, they can just run it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so uh, you're from a university. I think we didn't talk about that before. And you're from King's College in London. I got that right. Tomorrow <laughs> I, I introduced him with University College and, and, and this morning and uh, University College just seems like the biggest competitor. <laughs> um, so um, has this stuff actually been used or is it a purely research prototype thing? Well, it's a, it's a very good question. And yes, I am from King's. Um, the way this started was uh, I was involved in a research project and we were working with industry and we were working, in fact, uh, all, all to do with models, UML and so on. And we were creating DSLs and we, we were really in trouble trying to create these things ra- uh, rapidly. So I developed all this stuff uh, trying to find a way around my problem. And I kind of did it in isolation, which is the standard academic way of doing things. And then after I had a semi-useful product, I shipped it off to some of my industrial collaborators and they, they looked at it and went, hmm. Looks like it could be vaguely useful. They put a couple of people on, and gradually there's been a handful of people who've been creating real DSLs. So I've created a couple of fairly decent sized ones, mostly to do with model transformations. I did a system that has three interlocking DSLs, one to do with making little graphical languages, one with model transformations, and a related one. Those were a thousand lines of code or so. Not a big system, mm. but if you tried to do that in the traditional DSL creation mechanism, it would be very difficult. Yep. And uh, the industrial collaborators who are Tata Consultancy Services, who funded a lot of this research, have gone off and done some really interesting DSL work of their own. And, of course, they're not academics. They've chosen a whole load of very different things than I would ever have thought were practical of doing. Okay. So um, before we wrap up, do you want to kind of give us a couple of points of wisdom that you learned from your DSL creative creation experience that people should consider when building their own DSL infrastructure, maybe except from just using Converge? <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously, it would be very nice if, if people use Converge, and that's a almost guaranteed route to success. Um, <laughs> I think there's there's some things that I've noticed. Um, the first thing is that if you use an approach like Converge uses, you get some fairly easy-to-use DSLs. In other words, if someone can program, they don't have to know anything extra to use the DSL. The barrier to entry is very low. For you mean a, that's from a, from a DSL user's point of from view? From a DSL user's perspective, Because exactly. it fits in nicely into a generic programming environment. Exactly. So the, the barrier to using these things is very low, and that's very important. However, someone still has to go away and design these languages, and uh, design is a matter of taste. And some yeah. people have good taste, some people have bad taste, some people have no taste at all. Uh, and you are therefore reliant on whoever implements the DSL designing a good language. There's nothing Converge or anything else can do to force good design right, on people. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we uh, that I think I've become particularly aware of is where the advantage comes in in a DSL. And what's become clear to me is something that in a sense is very obvious. If you think of textual regular expressions, they're a way of expressing really complex constraints over text. You know, we use them on the command line or in grep or in Perl or whatever. And in a handful of characters, you can express something that if you had to write a program would take sometimes pages to write yep. and involve horrible things like backtracking. Yeah, yeah. So you get a lot of the benefit from DSLs when a t- bit of terse syntax allows you to express something very complicated. Yep. That said... Um, if you just add new syntax to your DSL willy-nilly, you end up in all sorts of problems because uh, it makes the things rather complicated to use. And also, um, 
Once you've added syntax to language, you can never take syntax away. Users become very yeah. attached to syntax. So it's better to start off in a cautious fashion, I've realized. Um, Make the language as small as possible. Start small. Always yeah. start small. You can't predict which way these things will go. And, and also, um, uh, another little psychological oddity of DSL users, if you give someone a library, they maybe say something like, I don't like the name of that function, or some very minor comments, but you don't tend to get that much pushback. When you give someone language, they suddenly feel as if they have the right to all sorts of opinions. <laughs> and you get back all sorts of feedback that you have to take account of. So the less you give them to begin with, the less you end up having to unpick. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And you can't predict what they will say. That's yeah. the one thing I'm sure of. Yeah. Um, one, one point I, I'd like to uh, touch on briefly at the end is um, that the issue of editor support. I mean, one reason why Ruby can be used for embedded DSLs is first of all it has a quite flexible syntax and second is it's it's not very strongly typed actually it's not at all statically typed so um, you don't have the typical editors with code completion syntax highlighting and all that stuff um, so I, I guess you, you somehow have the same issue here so if you have a piece of Converge code um, regular Converge code you might have an, an Emacs whatever it's called configuration to do syntax highlighting but you can't Easily, I mean, it's conceivable, but it's additional work to do to actually make their uh, a DSL-specific code completion syntax highlighting stuff. That's not the scope of the project at this time. It's it's certainly not something that that uh, I, I would personally be able to get involved in, mostly because uh, I'm, I'm a very old-fashioned and primitive person, and, and <laughs> on some days I'll program in five or six different programming languages, so I use a bog-standard text editor. Yeah. Um, but I do understand that people do want this richer yeah. text editing support, and I, I very much support that. Code completion is very nice. That, in, in the end, this takes us to the intentional programming folks, right, with whom we might talk at some later stage, maybe. But, I don't know. But So they have this full support, including editor, debugger, and stuff. So what about the debugging in your case? Um, there is no built-in debugger in Converge. Again, I'm, I'm a little bit old school. Printf, okay. Printf was given to me, and okay. it's done me ever since I found out about it. Yeah. Um, but I, going back to the editing issue, I think one of the good things about this is the barrier to entry is very low. If, if say... I said to you, when you create your DSL, you're also going to have to tell me how to do completion for yeah, that yeah. thing. And there are approaches which force that. Yeah. Um, then you suddenly raise the barrier a lot. Yeah. Could, could be optional, right? Yeah, but one of the things that Converge has going in its favor, although it is, like Ruby, a dynamically typed language, it's slightly more static. Mm. Things like variable references and module references are entirely determined at compile time. Mm -hmm. So actually, uh, you can probably make a much better stab at uh, completion than you can in similar languages and I think if you design your DSLs in the correct fashion you can make a similar good stab at those Yeah. Uh, but as you said that's not my main focus okay Okay. is there anything else you want to say at this time well it's uh, obviously thank you very much for the interview and yeah thank Conver you <laughs> <laughs> well Converge is still in its early days you know i wouldn't want anyone to bet their uh, business or their life on it but it is something i would very much encourage people to go and have a look at to give comments i think it's a really nice way of developing dsls it gives us something that we didn't really have before a very yep. nice mechanism yep. um so please you know feel free to go to the website and download the uh, versions it's convergepl.org and we'll put this in the show notes excellent thank you very much thank you and uh i think we're going to some party at the conference now so we have to I'm wrap sure. this up we only have 10 <laughs> minutes left <laughs> I'm sure it'll be a wild time thank you yeah, okay. bye Thanks for listening to Software Engineering Radio. If you want to get more information about Software Engineering Radio or if you want to give us feedback, please go to our website at se-radio.net. You can also contact the team at team at se-radio.net, although we prefer entries in our comments system on the website so other people can see what you think. Software Engineering Radio wants to thank Henning Pauli for the intro and outro music as well as Lipson for providing the bandwidth.
This episode of SE Radio, as well as all other episodes, is licensed under Creative Commons license. See the Software Engineering Radio website for details.